The men who took part in the recovery were told never to talk about the incident. The Roswell event faded quickly from public view and press scrutiny. Roswell. The name alone sparks fear in many, curiosity in others, and often both. But what exactly happened at Roswell? Were we given the whole story? In today's video, we'll be learning everything there is to know about this case. And let us know in the comments which UFO story you would like to hear about next. The Roswell UFO incident took place in the U.S. in 1947 when an airborne object crashed on a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico in June or July of 1947. Explanations of what took place are based on both official and unofficial communications. Although the crash is attributed to a U.S. military surveillance balloon by the U.S. government, the most famous explanation of what occurred is that the object was a spacecraft containing extraterrestrial life. Since the late 1970s, the Roswell incident has been the subject of much controversy. The United States Armed Forces maintains that what was recovered near Roswell was debris from the crash of an experimental high-altitude surveillance balloon belonging to what was then a classified top secret program named Mogul. In contrast, many UFO proponents maintain that an alien craft was found, its occupants were captured, and that the military engaged in a massive cover-up. The Roswell incident has turned into a widely known pop culture phenomenon, making the name Roswell synonymous with UFOs. Roswell has become the most publicized of all alleged UFO incidents. On July 8, 1947, the Roswell Army Airfield RAAF, Public Information Officer Walter Hout issued a press release stating that personnel from the field's 509th Operations Group had recovered a flying disc which had crashed on a ranch near Roswell. Later that day, the press reported that Commanding General of the 8th Air Force, Roger Ramey, had stated that a weather balloon was recovered by the RAAF personnel. A press conference was held featuring debris foil, rubber, and wood said to be from the crashed object, which seemed to confirm its description as a weather balloon. Subsequently, the incident faded from the attention of UFO researchers for over 30 years. In 1978, physicist and UFOologist Stanton T. Friedman interviewed Major Jesse Marcel, who was involved with the original recovery of the debris in 1947. Marcel expressed his belief that the military covered up the recovery of an alien spacecraft. His story spread through UFO circles, being featured in some UFO documentaries at the time. In February 1980, the National Enquirer ran its own interview with Marcel, garnering national and worldwide attention for the Roswell incident. Additional witnesses added significant new details, including claims of a large-scale military operation dedicated to recovering alien craft and aliens themselves at as many as 11 crash sites and alleged witness intimidation. In 1989, former mortician Glenn Dennis put forth a detailed personal account wherein he claimed alien autopsies were carried out at the Roswell base. In response to these reports, and after United States congressional inquiries, the General Accounting Office launched an inquiry and directed the Office of the United States Secretary of the Air Force to conduct an internal investigation. The result was summarized in two reports. The first, released in 1995, concluded that the reported recovered material in 1947 was likely debris from Project Mogul. The second report, released in 1997, concluded reports of recovered alien bodies were likely a combination of innocently transformed memories of military accidents involving injured or killed personnel innocently transformed memories of the recovery of anthropomorphic dummies and military programs like Operation High Dive conducted in the 1950s and hoaxes perpetuated by various witnesses and UFO proponents. The psychological effects of time compression and confusion about when events occurred explain the discrepancy with the years in question. These reports were dismissed by UFO proponents as being either disinformation or simply implausible. But at the same time, several high-profile UFO researchers discounted the possibility that the incident had anything to do with aliens. Contemporary Accounts On July 14, 1947, William Brazel, a foreman working on the Foster Homestead, 
noticed strange clusters of debris approximately 30 miles north of Roswell, New Mexico. This date, or about three weeks before July 8th, appeared in later stories featuring Brazel, but the initial press release from the Roswell Army Airfield said that find was sometime last week, suggesting Brazel found the debris in early July. Brazel told the Roswell Daily Record that he and his son saw a large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tinfoil, a rather tough paper and sticks. He paid little attention to it, but returned on July 4th with his son, wife, and daughter to gather up the material. Some accounts have described Brazel as having gathered some of the material earlier, rolling it together and stashing it under some brush. The next day, Brazel heard reports about flying discs and wondered if that was what he had picked up. On July 7th, Brazel saw Sheriff Wilcox and whispered kinda confidential-like that he may have found a flying disc. Another account quotes Wilcox as saying Brazel reported the object on July 6th. Wilcox called RAAF Major Jesse Marcel and a man in plain clothes, accompanied Brazel back to the ranch where more pieces were picked up. We spent a couple of hours Monday afternoon, July 7th, looking for any more parts of the weather device, said Marcel. We found a few more patches of tinfoil and rubber. As described in the July 9th, 1947 edition of the Roswell Daily Record, the balloon which held it up, if that was how it worked, must have been 12 feet long. Brazel felt, measuring the distance by the size of the room in which he sat. The rubber was smoky gray in color and scattered over an area about 200 yards in diameter. When the debris was gathered up, the tin-foiled paper, tape, and sticks made a bundle of about 3 feet long and 7 or 8 inches thick, while the rubber made a bundle about 18 or 20 inches long and about 8 inches thick. In all, he estimated, the entire lot would have weighed maybe 5 pounds. There was no sign of any metal in the area which might have been used for an engine and no sign of any propellers of any kind, although at least one paper fin had been glued onto some of the tinfoil. There were no words to be found anywhere on the instrument, although there were letters on some of the parts. Considerable scotch tape and some tape with flowers printed upon it had been used in the construction. No strings or wires were to be found, but there were some eyelets in the paper to indicate that some sort of attachment may have been used. A telex sent to an FBI office from Fort Worth, Texas office quoted a major from the 8th Air Force, also based in Fort Worth at Carswell Air Force Base, on July 8, 1947, as saying that the disc is hexagonal in shape and was suspended from a balloon by cable, which balloon was approximately 20 feet in diameter. Major Curtin further advises that the object found resembles a high-altitude weather balloon with a radar reflector but the telephonic conversation between their office and Wright Field had not, unintelligible, borne out this belief. Early on Tuesday, July 8th, the RAAF issued a press release which was immediately picked up by numerous news outlets. The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. The flying object landed on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Not having phone facilities, the rancher stored the disc until such time as he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Major Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Action was immediately taken and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Marcel to higher headquarters. Colonel William H. Blanchard, commanding officer of the 509th, contacted General Roger M. Ramey of the 8th Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas, and Ramey ordered the object be flown to Fort Worth Army Airfield. At the base, Warrant Officer Irving Newton confirmed Ramey's preliminary opinion, identifying the object as being a weather balloon and its kite a nickname for a radar reflector used to track the balloons from the ground. Another news release was issued, this time from the Fort Worth base, describing the object as being a weather balloon. Witnesses Witness accounts emergence of alien narratives In 1978, nuclear physicist and author Stanton T. Friedman interviewed Jesse Marcel, the only person known to have accompanied the Roswell debris from where it was recovered to Fort Worth where reporters saw material which was claimed to be part of the recovered object. 
The accounts given by Friedman and others in the following years elevated Roswell from a forgotten incident to perhaps the most famous UFO case of all time. By the early 1990s, UFO researchers such as Friedman, William Moore, Carl T. Flock, and the team of Kevin D. Randall and Donald R. Schmidt interviewed several hundred people who had, or claimed to have had, a connection with the events at Roswell in 1947. Additionally, hundreds of documents were obtained via Freedom of Information Act requests, and some were supposedly leaked by insiders, such as the so-called Majestic 12 Papers. Their conclusions were at least one alien craft had crashed in the Roswell vicinity. Aliens, some possibly still alive, were recovered and a massive cover-up of any knowledge of the incident was put in place. Over the years, books, articles, television specials, and a made-for-TV movie brought the 1947 incident significant notoriety. By the mid-1990s, public polls such as a 1997 CNN-Time magazine poll revealed that the majority of people interviewed believed that aliens had indeed visited Earth and that aliens had landed at Roswell, but that all the relevant information was being kept secret by the U.S. government. Various narratives evolved, starting with Friedman's 1978 interviews with Marcel, through publication of the first book on Roswell in 1980, to new accounts and new books appearing into the early 90s. Many new witnesses had by then emerged, as had new accounts that detailed recoveries of alien corpses and alien autopsies. Skeptics such as Philip Klass and Richard Todd published objections to the plausibility of these accounts, but it was not until 1994 and the publication of the first United States Air Force report on the incident that a strong counter-argument to the presence of aliens was widely publicized. Various authors enumerated different alien scenarios which often contradicted each other, based on what the documentary evidence suggested and on which witness accounts were accepted or dismissed. This was especially true for the various claimed sites for the crash and recovery sites of alien craft. Various authors had different witnesses who described different locations for these events. The outline from UFO Crash at Roswell, 1991, by Randall and Schmidt is common to many of these accounts. A UFO crashed northwest of Roswell, New Mexico in the summer of 1947. The military acted quickly and efficiently to recover the debris after its existence was reported by a ranch hand. The debris, unlike anything these highly trained men had ever seen, was flown without delay to at least three government installations. A cover story was concocted to explain away the debris and the flurry of activity. It was explained that a weather balloon, one with a new radio sound target device, had been found and temporarily confused the personnel of the 509th Bomb Group. Government officials took reporters' notes from their desks and warned a radio reporter not to play a recorded interview with the ranch hand. The men who took part in the recovery were told never to talk about the incident, and with a whimper, not a bang, the Roswell event faded quickly from public view and press scrutiny. The Roswell Incident, 1980 The first book on the Roswell UFO incident was The Roswell Incident, 1980 by Charles Burlitz and William Moore. The authors claimed to have interviewed over 90 witnesses. Though he was uncredited, Friedman carried out some research for the book. The Roswell incident featured accounts of debris described by Marcel as nothing made on this earth. Additional accounts by Bill Brazel, son of Mac Brazel, neighbor Floyd Proctor, and Walt Whitman Jr., son of newsman W.E. Whitman, who had interviewed Mac Brazel, suggested the material Marcel recovered had super strength not associated with a weather balloon. The book introduced the contention that debris which was recovered by Marcel at the Foster Ranch, visible in photographs showing Marcel posing with the debris, was substituted for debris from a weather device as part of a cover-up. The book also claimed that the debris recovered from the ranch was not permitted a close inspection by the press. The efforts by the military were described as being intended to discredit and counteract the growing hysteria towards flying saucers. Two accounts of witness intimidation were included in the book, including the incarceration of Mac Brazel. The book included a report of Roswell residents Dan Wilmot and his wife seeing two inverted saucers faced mouth to mouth, passing overhead on July 2nd, as were other reports of mysterious objects seen flying overhead. The Roswell incident introduced an alien account by Saqqara, New Mexico resident Barney Barnett, who had died years earlier. 
Friends of Barnett said he described the crash of a flying saucer and the recovery of alien corpses in the vicinity of Sakaro, about 150 miles, 240 kilometers west of the Foster Ranch. He and a group of archaeologists stumbled upon an alien craft and its occupants on the morning of July 3rd, only to be led away by military personnel. Further accounts suggested that the aliens and the craft were transported to Edwards Air Force Base in California. The book suggested that either there were two crafts that crashed or that debris from the vehicle Barnett described had subsequently landed on the Foster Ranch after an explosion. Marcel said he heard about it on July 7th when the Sheriff Brazel had called him, but said on Sunday, July 6th, Brazel decided he had better go into town and report this to someone, and that Brazel in turn called Marcel, suggesting, though not stating, that Marcel was contacted on July 6th. In 1947, Marcel was quoted as saying that he visited the ranch on Monday, July 7th. Marcel described returning to Roswell the evening of July 7th to find that news of the incident had been leaked. Calls were made to Marcel's house, and he had a visit from a reporter, but he would not confirm the reports to the press. The next morning, that written press release went out, and after that, things really hit the fan. The book suggested that the military orchestrated Brazel's testimony in order to make it appear that a mundane object had crash-landed on the ranch. Brazel went to great pains to tell the newspaper people exactly what the Air Force had instructed him to say regarding how he had come to discover the wreckage and what it looked like. UFO Crash at Roswell, 1991 In 1991, with the benefit of publicity from new witness interviews, Kevin Randall and Donald Schmidt published UFO Crash at Roswell. In this account, the timelines of the incident were slightly altered. The date Brazel reported the debris and Marcel went to the ranch was said to be Sunday, July 6th, not the next day, as some of the original accounts suggested and the Roswell incident left unclear. Marcel and an unidentified counterintelligence agent were said to have spent the night at the ranch. The two gathered material on Monday, then Marcel supposedly dropped by his house on the way to the Roswell base in the early hours of Tuesday, July 8th. Some new details emerged, including accounts of a gouge that extended four or 500 feet at the ranch and descriptions of an elaborate cordon and recovery operation. Several witnesses in the Roswell incident described being turned back from the Foster Ranch by armed military police, but extensive descriptions were not given. The Barnett accounts were mentioned, though the dates and locations were changed from the accounts found in the Roswell incident. In the new account, Brazel was described as leading the army to a second crash site on the ranch, at which point the army personnel were supposedly horrified to find civilians, including Barnett, there already. Glenn Dennis had emerged as an important witness in 1989 after calling the hotline when an episode of Unsolved Mysteries featured the Roswell incident. His description of Roswell alien autopsies were the first account that said there were alien corpses at the Roswell Army base. No mention, except in passing, was made of the claim found in the Roswell incident that the Roswell aliens and the craft were shipped to Edwards Air Force Base. The 1991 book seemed to establish a chain of events with alien corpses being seen at a crash site, the bodies then being shipped to the Roswell base as witnessed by Dennis and then flown to Fort Worth and finally to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, the last known location of the bodies. The book introduced an account from General Arthur E. Exxon, an officer stationed at the alleged final resting place of the recovered material. He stated there was a shadowy group, which he called the Unholy Thirteen, who controlled and had access to whatever was recovered. He later stated, In the 55 time period, when Exxon was at the Pentagon, there was also the story that whatever happened, whatever was found at Roswell was still closely held and probably would be held until these fellows I mentioned had died, so they wouldn't be embarrassed or they wouldn't have to explain why they covered it off. Until the original 13 died off, and I don't think anyone is going to release anything until the last one's gone. Crash at Corona, 1992 in 1992, a third book, Crash at Corona, was published. Written by Friedman and Don Berliner, it suggested a high-level cover-up of a UFO recovery, based on documents which were anonymously dropped off at a UFO researcher's house in 1984. The documents were purported to be 1,952 briefing papers for incoming President Dwight Eisenhower, describing a high-level government agency whose purpose was to investigate aliens recovered at Roswell and to keep such information hidden from public view. 
Friedman had done much of the research for the Roswell incident with William Moore and Crash at Corona built on this research. The title of the book was Corona, New Mexico rather than Roswell, New Mexico, because Corona is geographically closer to the Foster Ranch crash site. The timeline of events that the book gives is the same as the previous account, with Marcel and Sheridan Cavett, a counterintelligence agent who was likely the man in plain clothes described by Brazil in 1947, visiting the ranch on July 6th. The 1992 book says, however, that Brazil was taken into custody for about a week and escorted into the offices of the Roswell Daily Record on July 10th, where he gave an account that he had been told to give by the government. A sign of the disagreements between various researchers is evident, as Friedman and Berliner moved the Barnett account back to near Socorro and introduced a new eyewitness account of the site. The new account is from Gerald Anderson, who provided vivid descriptions of both a downed alien craft and four aliens, of which at least one was alive. The authors note much of the evidence had been dismissed by the authors of UFO Crash at Roswell and that this had been done without a solid basis. The 1992 authors also mention a personality conflict between Anderson and Randall, meaning that Friedman was the author who investigated his claim. The book, however, does largely embrace the same sequence of events as the account in UFO Crash at Roswell, where aliens are seen at the Roswell Army Airfield based on the Dennis account, and then shipped off to Fort Worth and subsequently to Wright Field. The book suggests that as many as eight alien corpses were recovered from two crash sites, three dead and perhaps one alive from the Foster Ranch, and three dead and one living from the Socorro site. The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, 1994 In 1994, Randall and Schmidt published The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. While it restated a majority of the case as laid out in their earlier book, new and expanded accounts of aliens were included, and a new location for the recovery of aliens was detailed. Additionally, an almost completely new scenario for the sequence of events was laid out. For the first time, the airborne object was said to have crashed on the evening of July 4th instead of July 2nd, which was the date used in all the previous books. Another important difference was the assertion that the alien recovery was well underway before Brazil traveled to Roswell with his news about the debris on the Foster Ranch. Apparently, several objects had been tracked by radar for a few days in the vicinity before one crashed. In all previous accounts, the military was made aware of the alleged alien crash only when Brazil came forward. Additionally, Brazil was said to have given his news conference on July 9th, and the 1994 book claims that his press conference and the initial news release announcing the discovery of a flying disc were all part of an elaborate ruse to shift attention away from the true crash site. The book featured a new witness account describing an alien craft and aliens from Jim Ragsdale at a new location north of Roswell instead of closer to Corona on the Foster Ranch. Corroboration was given by accounts from a group of archaeologists. Five alien corpses were supposedly seen. The book states that although the Foster Ranch was also a source of debris, no bodies were recovered from it. The book also features expanded accounts from Dennis and Kaufman and a new account from Ruben Anaya which describes New Mexico Lieutenant Governor Joseph Montoya's claim that he saw alien corpses at the Roswell base. More disagreement between Roswell researchers forms part of the book. A full chapter is devoted to dismissing the Barnett and Anderson accounts from Socorro, a central part of Crash at Corona and the Roswell incident. Barnett's story and the Plains of San Agustin near Socorro scenario must be discarded, say the authors, an appendix is devoted to describing Majestic 12 as a hoax. The two Randall and Schmidt books remain highly influential in the UFO community, their interviews and conclusions widely reproduced on websites. Randall and Schmidt claim to have conducted more than 2,000 interviews with more than 500 people during their Roswell investigations. UFO Community Schism By 1994, when the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell was published, a schism had emerged from within the UFO community about the events in the Roswell UFO incident. The Center for UFO Studies, SUFOS, and the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, two leading UFO societies, disagreed in their views of the various scenarios presented by Randall and Schmidt and Friedman and Berliner. Several conferences were held to try to resolve the differences. One of the center issues under discussion 
was where Barnett was when he saw the alien craft he was said to have encountered. A 1992 UFO conference attempted to achieve a consensus among the various scenarios portrayed in Crash at Corona and UFO Crash at Roswell. However, the publication of The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell had resolved the Barnett problem by simply ignoring Barnett and citing a new location for the alien craft recovery, including a new group of archaeologists not connected to the ones the Barnett story cited. Alien Autopsy Footage is where we will be picking up on our next installment, and you definitely don't want to miss it. So subscribe now and turn on all notifications, or you might end up on a future episode of UFO Files. Oh. <laughs>